This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. And by our giving, God watches how we give. Jesus sat back and watched how the people give. And Jesus still leans back today watching us to see how we give and what our motive is. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word. I'm Pastor Bob Yandy, and we are taking up this entire week, all five days, on the subject of a balance on prosperity to understand truly that God is the one that gave it and God never gives us anything to heap on ourselves. And so again, the purpose of prosperity is spreading the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Turn with me and when you find that scripture, we'll get into it. And that's Ephesians chapter four and verse 28. But I wanna give you a quick review of what we've covered so far this week. Number one, prosperity is the will of God. All right, God desires for us to prosper. In fact, he delights in our prosperity. We read that in the book of Psalms. And uh, he delights in those who favor his righteous cause and that is spreading of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And uh, with the Bible told us, and also in Deuteronomy chapter 8, that in those verses of Scripture, when you come into the promised land, he says, remember, it's he that gives you power to get wealth so his covenant can be established, which is on the earth. So God has so much prosperity out there, he wants to bring it to us. And today we're going to take up the subject on where does seed come from? It, where does the finances come from to start being blessed in the kingdom of God? Where does it come from? And so, uh, beginning in this verse of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, let's read this. It says, Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him who needs. Well, the, what this verse simply saying, if you don't have a job, you're stealing. Yeah, but no, 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 my parents are taking care of me. If you're old enough to work and can go get at work, then you're stealing from your parents. Yeah, but you know, I've asked some friends for some money and they, they, they gave it to me. Well, listen, if you could get a job and don't have a job and you're asking your friends for money, then I can tell you what's happening. You're stealing from them. This verse simply says, if you can work and you can get a job, then quit stealing from those around you. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather, it goes on to say, let him labor. This word for labor means to work hard to the point of sweating. And so this verse says, work hard, working with your hands. This is how all jobs begin. All jobs start out with manual labor. In fact, manual comes from the word for hands. Manos in the Spanish means hands. And so we have here again, working with your hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needs. You know, when a kid comes to you, know, here's the first thing what this, this is saying is, this should be taught from the time kids are young. Son, it's time to find, start looking for yourself a job. You know why? So uh, in, that you can have money. And the first thing they're thinking of is, yeah, because I want to buy, you know, a car. I want to buy a Camaro. I want to buy this or that. I, I'm looking forward to buying a car. That should not be your motivating thought. This verse says is that the first thing you should do is get a job and the first motivation is so you start giving in the kingdom of God. Teach your children from a young age that they're to work with their hands so that you will have to give, give to those that have need. From the time that young people start in this life with money, teach them the object of money as a Christian is not to buy you a car first. It's to be a blessing to other people first. And whatever's left over, that will meet your needs. And God will see to it that there's more than enough because what God is looking for from the time you start working is a generous attitude. And so when our children started working, what's the first thing we taught them? You give your tithes to the Lord. About that, you give offerings to people that come in and the rest of it, put aside. Just keep it aside, off to the side. In the meantime, you're being blessed because you're living here with us in the family and all that. But I'm teaching you from the very moment you get your first job, what your priorities in life will be from now on. God comes First, seeking his will to give into other people's lives comes first. This is the most important thing in the Christian life. So again, if you don't have a job, you're stealing from others. Don't depend on your job for your living. I'm going to say that again. Don't depend on your job for your living. There is no job on the earth which will pay you enough to live like God wants you to live. 
<laughs> I'm going to say that again. There is no job on the face of the earth which will pay you enough to live like God wants you to live. Your job is where you go to get seed. Your job is not your income. Your job is not your source. It's where you go to get seed. In other words, when they pay you that paycheck, if it says, you know, like $300, that's 300 seeds in there, what God's telling you. And so the first thing is take some of that, the very best of it, because the word tithe means to take the best, the top, right off the top. The tithe is the best and the most important, the very finest of the fruit. And so you give your first fruits of your increase to the Lord. So you take it right off the top and put that seed over there, knowing that every seed has a hundredfold potential. You know, it's been said of this before, that you can count the kernels on an ear of corn, but only God can count the number of, of corns inside of a kernel. Okay, God's the only one that can tell you how many cobs of corn can come from a kernel. You don't know that. You have to, you know, you just, you, what you do is you plant the corn in the ground, boom, out of that one seed comes all this stuff. And God's simply saying that's the way it works in his kingdom. So you go to a place to, to work for that place so that you can get seed. I don't go to my job to get my income. I don't go to my job so that my, I can just make a living. I don't go to the job because it's my source. And so many people get upset and say, no, this is my source. No, God is your source. And through that job, God God gives seed to you and that seed is what you begin to sow to begin prosperity. And again, there's no job on the face of the earth that'll pay you enough to live like God wants you to. Your job is where you go to get seed each and every day. Seed is to be used to come from the hole that you are in right now. Through your giving, you can begin to come out of that hole. Through your love for God, you begin to come out of that hole as you see what truly financial blessing is. Through sowing, you really begin to live. We need to see giving as a gain, not as a loss. The Bible says more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we often see, well, I gave that money, to, I've lost that money. No, no farmer puts seed in the ground thinking he's lost something. He sees that as a long-term gain. Right now, it's simply departed from him, but it's going to produce and then come back him from what's going to come out of the ground. He's going to get more than he had before, but he's also going to have more to sell to the people around there to make an income. And this goes for his business. And he sees that as a great chance to feed many. And what comes out of the ground, whether it's corn or wheat or whatever, is going to make many, many plates full around the country. And that's because of him. So he sees again the power that's in a seed. No farmer sees the seed as only something he can eat because he knows why. He'll eat it all up and it'll be gone portion of it goes back into planning, which provides for the future. This is the way God says, instead of seeing as dollar bills, seed is seed. Instead of seeing as change, seed is seed. And God can take the smallest of seeds, even the grain of mustard seed, and make the biggest tree on the earth that exists out of one small mustard seed. Again, we need to see our giving as a gain, not as a loss. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10. And here we again find out where seed comes from and the purpose of seed. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says this, He who ministers seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food, multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your labor. I want you to notice this, all seed comes from God. No, it came from the place I work. No, it came from God. God's the one that originally put all the gold and the silver and the precious stones in this earth. And Adam was entrusted with it. He then sinned and turned it over to Satan. Satan now has the control over it, but God has the ability to take it out of Satan's kingdom, bring it into ours, and that's as we give. As we become a giver, loving God and loving his kingdom and loving the preaching of the gospel, we pull money out of the world. Remember I told you again in one of these lessons that the church is over here and the world is over here and the one that stands right on the border between the two is business, especially Christian businesses. And a Christian businessman knows how to take money out of the world and bring it into the church. He knows how to do that. He becomes a bridge and that bridge brings money out of the world into the church, but it also takes money out of the church and puts it back into the world into Christian organizations in the spreading of the gospel. And this is what God's intention is. So the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just, but how it comes into the church is mainly through business. And so that's why I enjoy speaking to Christian businessmen because to tell them they stand on the borders between the world and the church is so important to help as a bridge to bring in that finances into the kingdom of God. So again, all seed comes from God. God's purpose for money is threefold. Number one, to supply for your family. That is food for your table. Number two is seed for the gospel. And number three is eternal reward. I want to read that again. He who ministers seed to the sower ministers bread for your food. Multiply your seed sown and increase the, increase the fruits or the rewards of your righteousness. So the three things is number one, God gives you uh, 
my finances for it. Put food on the table. Number two is I want you to notice this, and he multiplies seed sown. Notice he doesn't multiply seed kept. He doesn't multiply seed in your wallet. Doesn't multiply the seed in the bank account. You say, yeah, but my bank account offers me 2%. That's nothing compared to what God wants to do for you because he multiplies seed sown. It doesn't begin to multiply in God's kingdom until it's taken out of the bank. It's taken out of your wallet, out of that bag that you carry that the seed was taken and thrown out uh, from the bag. No, he, he, takes, he takes it. When you take it out and you put it in his kingdom, that's when seed is sown. He multiplies seed sown, not seed kept. So multiply seed sown is so important. And the third thing is it brings about eternal rewards. You understand you're giving for the eternal rewards. And that is every soul that is one every family that's brought in, every sinner that comes to Jesus Christ, every carnal Christian that comes back to the Lord, everything we are doing, we're doing for the eternal kingdom of God. And one day we will have final rewards for it when we get to heaven. Yeah, we'll be rewarded this lifetime. Rewards do come, but the, multi but the great amount will be multiplied back to us in eternity. Because what I get on this earth is only a small portion compared to the great rewards. It'll be eternal when I get to heaven. So again, prosperity is a multiplication of seeds sown for more. And what happens when more comes in? Well, then I have more supply for my family. I have more seed to sow the gospel, and I have greater eternal rewards. This thing is just a vicious circle that keeps going over and over and over again. Look at Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. We're going to read down through verse 44, and I want you to see what God looks at when we give. Does God look at how much money we put in? Eh, not really. God looks at something else. Look at verse 41. And Jesus sat over opposite the treasury and watched how the people cast money into the treasury. Many were, uh, were rich, cast in much, and those that were the poor widow, she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. He called unto him his disciples and said unto them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more in than those all who put it into the treasury. For all of them put of their abundance or their surplus, but she of her want did cast into all that she had, even uh, of her living. What he was doing, this, I want you the most important thing here is, is Jesus didn't watch how much money they put in, he watched how they give. He watched the motive behind their giving. And it says of the Pharisees when they came that they would have trumpets actually sound before they would drop big coins into the offering where people go ooh and ah. Because you see, people look at how much you give, but God looks at the motive of your heart. And what he saw was people putting in great amounts of money, but it was a small portion compared to the real riches they had. But he watched this woman put in two mites. And when he did, she dropped it. He said she gave more than they did because this was about all that she had. But she gave out of a love for Jesus. She gave out of a love for God. She gave out of a love for the gospel. And this is the most important reason why we give. This is why God loves to see how we give. Jesus tells us how important our giving is to God himself. And Jesus watches at offering time to see how we give. God wants our giving to be precious to us because souls are precious to us. The gospel is precious to us. And by our giving, God watches how we give. Jesus sat back and watched how the people give. And Jesus still leans back today watching us to see how we give and what our motive is. Are we giving out of love? Are we giving out of generosity? Are we giving out of a grace toward God that He out of grace has given toward us? We'll see you right after the break. Don't go anywhere as we continue on this subject of where seed comes from. God did not create you to be a slave to the world's economic system or to barely scrape by, living from paycheck to paycheck. He made you to live in divine prosperity with more than you need so you could help whenever and wherever there is a need. With From Just Enough to Overflowing, Pastor Bob Yandian shows you how to climb out of getting by with just enough and begin living in God's abundance. More than just another book on the importance of giving, this powerful book teaches life-changing principles that will help you eliminate anything that hinders you from obeying God's Word. Bring life to your offerings. Open the gate to prosperity. Apply the laws of seed time and harvest. And step into overflowing abundance. To order from Just Enough to Overflowing, visit bobyandian.com or call 918-250-250. 2207. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207.
I want to go back to that verse of scripture that we left off with just before the break came from Mark chapter 12 on Jesus watched how the people gave. How we give is important to God, not just how much we give. So much, so most time it's how much we give. We want to brag to God about how much we gave. When, you know what? God has it all in the first place. The God has so much wealth in this earth. He, has, he owns the cattle, everything on the earth. He owns it. Although Satan right now has authority over it, it's still God's property. That's why he can take it and give it to us. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. So God can take it right out of the hands of the wicked and give it to us, but he's looking for people he can trust it with. That unlike the world, we won't heap it on ourselves. Unlike the world, we won't sow it into ungodly causes. We will give it into the soul winning aspect, evangelism in this earth to help to fulfill the great commission. Mark chapter 12 says in verse 41, Jesus sat opposite of the treasury, watched how the people cast money in the treasury. Many who were rich cast in much, but there came a poor widow and she threw in two mites, which makes a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more in than all who have put into the treasury. For all them put of their abundance, that's their surplus, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even of her living. He said that he looked at her, and although she had needs, she still gave to the kingdom of God. You know, there comes times in our lives when perhaps we have setbacks, and people often tell me, I can't give in the church this week. I said, you know what, you can give something. I mean, think about this. You started with a little bit. And you know what, if you have to go back to giving just a little bit, even though you have a need, quit seeing all of it as a means of meeting your need. Don't quit sowing seed. And so give a portion to seven and also to eight. It says in the book of Ecclesiastes, for you know not what evil shall be upon the earth. In other words, you're giving also far beyond the time when you are uh, running into a need, you are being blessed. And God simply says that we are to know that. And in case a time of need comes along, your giving helps to hedge against that and becomes a buffer, becomes one of those things that can help to stop the things of the devil as it comes into your life. So again, we come back to it, how important our giving is and the way we give is to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he looks for is how we give to him. Again, not so much how much we give. It says of the Pharisees, not only did they sound the trumpet, but the sounding of the trumpet was to bring attention to them as they held up their offerings so everybody could see how big the coins were and drop it in. How often do we do that in church? We make out a check. We want to wait to just be slightly bend over to where anybody can look over and see how big our check is because we're impressed at how much we give. People may be impressed at how much we give, but God is not impressed at all. That's why he said, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. What he's simply saying was, he says, don't even let it be seen. In other words, keep it secret. And when he said, when you pray, go into your closet. Don't pray in public. You know, there's times you have to pray in public, pray over a meal or if you're asked to pray over a certain thing. But your real intimate prayers with God, don't do it where people can see you, where people can walk by and go, ooh, isn't he spiritual? God says right there, you've lost your rewards. If you give so that people can see how much you give, you have lost your reward. Your reward is the oohs and the ahs that people say over you after you give. But God says, no, if you will not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, he says, I will see to it you're blessed beyond your wildest imaginations. He says, I love it when people give only to be seen of God and to be seen of themselves and so that people can be blessed. One of the greatest things I remember people would say, they would come to me during a building campaign and they'd give me a check, say, Pastor, and they have it folded up. I'm giving this, but don't tell anybody I gave it. I don't want anybody to know. I want to just do this between me and you and me and God. Well, to me, that was one of the greatest blessings because this is what God is looking for, is that where they know only God can see how much they have given or maybe them and the pastor can see how much they've given. And in this particular case, only the Lord could see what she was doing because no one around could see how much she put. She probably did it in her hand, looked around, make sure nobody was looking at it, plunk, dropped it in. She wanted only God to understand what she was doing because Jesus was sitting back watching how the people gave. So again, our giving is precious to the Lord and should be precious to us because God sees our giving as another opportunity. And I don't even know how far it goes. I mean, we often think we dropped a dollar in. I wonder how much a dollar can actually go to as far as winning a soul. If we were to take souls around the world and average the cost of getting the gospel to them, I wonder how much it would come to. And we begin to find out just how much can be accomplished through our giving. And what sometimes we think it's little, but to God it is much. And we start to be multiplied back to us to increase it and to increase it, knowing that more effectively we can help to win people to the kingdom of God. Let me just give you some practical ways to prosper. In the Bible, there's practical ways to prosper. And the first thing I would recommend is give a separate account. Make a separate account in your bank account just for giving. 
you know, or else make sure you draw a circle around that it never gets below a certain figure in your, in your, in your uh, checking account because you always want to have enough to give to the kingdom of God. But what I always recommend, especially to young people, is have yourself an account. I know of young kids that really they have a jar sitting there and they throw in their extra change and change just mounts up. And that's only for giving into the things of God. And they use it for a certain time to give to the youth group as they're going out on a missions trip. Or they use it for the children's ministries and go out to sing uh, Easter uh, uh, music or Christmas music as they go out to minister to people in nursing nursing homes or something like that, or there's going to be a missions trip come up from the church and you're sending out people from the church. Many of the groups we sent out was a combination of people to spread the gospel and doctors. And they went out. The doctors would help open up the doors to countries that probably the gospel could not have got into without it. But once they got in there, then there would be those that worked on their sicknesses and diseases and pulled teeth and things like that while somebody else was there preaching the gospel. And not only did they lose their teeth, a tooth once in a while, they also lost their sin and they became a child of God and they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But you know what? It takes money to help them send them out and we have people that give. We have youth groups that gone into missions trips. There's youth groups gone into missions trips that help with the feeding of people and things like that and going to foreign countries or even right here in the United States going to minister to people that are really down and out but need Jesus Christ. It's not the fact they need the money. We're going to use the money as a tool to help pry the door open to get the real riches in there, the riches of Jesus Christ. We're not just to give food. Bread for their mouth and bread for their table should only be representation of the bread of righteousness and the bread of the Word of God. And not just clothing, but also represent that clothing represents the robes of righteousness, which we can get to them. And this physical clothing is going to open up the door so they can receive eternal salvation. And one day they can become a minister, not just be ministered to, but actually be a person that is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So again, these are practical ways to minister. Start mailing a separate account for giving beyond the tithe. The tithe automatically belongs to the Lord. Just right off the top of it, make a tithe. I know people say that's Old Testament. No, it's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12, and it's mentioned it's part of the New Testament. It actually started before the law was given, before Abraham came, I mean, before Moses came along and the tribe of Levi, before that time ever came, there was Abraham who gave to Melchizedek, and the law didn't even exist at that time. Melchizedek is the type of Jesus Christ. Our tithes go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then it started before the law. The law was here. Then after the law, it's still there. I mean, we're, let's mention over again in Hebrews chapter 12. Here today, men who die receive tithes. And that men who die was written to the book of Hebrews, which was after the day of Pentecost where the church started and the law was over on the cross. So again, it's after the law. We still have tithing today because it's a means of giving to God. And so it says that uh, people gave their tithes unto the Lord on the first day they met together. They gave of their offerings unto the Lord. And this particular thing is just used by stingy people. Stingy people are always talking about, oh, well, the tithe isn't for today. You stingy thing. It is for today. It's a means of giving to God. And beyond that, to give of your offerings unto the Lord beyond the tithe given to the Lord. So again, this is a practical way to give. Begin a separate account. Number two, when extra comes into that account, let it grow. When extra starts to come in, throw it over there. Again, I know people that walk in at the end of the day and the change in their pocket, they think, you know, I'll use it for a car wash. Or if they, nah, throw it in there because what's more important is winning of souls and let those quarters and nickels and dimes mount up and see how much can come into it to where one day you go and you give it into missions work. This is what, again, a means of giving into the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, uh, and then again, the third thing I would recommend is confess a scripture daily. Here's a scripture I think would be great for you to confess. Psalm 35 and verse 27, we have already read it, but mark it down. I think this be something you should look at every day. It tells God's attitude toward you and what your attitude should be toward people and the spreading of the gospel. Psalm 35 verse 27 says this, let them say continually. So if we are to say it continually, say it continually. Continue doesn't mean a stream of it all day long. No, it means from time to time. Let it become something that you not just say, but don't let it be empty words. Think about what you're saying. Don't just let it come out of your mouth without thinking and meditating on it. Think and meditate on it, and then every word becomes important. Let them say continually, here's what you're to say, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Lord, I want you to have pleasure in my prosperity. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Who are the ones that's magnified? 
those who favor His righteous cause. Lord, I favor Your righteous cause. Your righteous cause is people. The great commission you left us before you left this earth was go into all the world and preach the gospel. Lord, I can't personally go into all the world. We can all go into all the world, but I can also help to fund people to go into these areas that need finances to help build churches, to help build orphanages, to help build homes for people, to help them plant crops. Lord, all these things are to open up a door so they can have the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know a man that went into a country that was very poor. And in fact, when he got there, they were eating the bark off the trees and eating the grass off the ground. There was nothing left. When he came in, the they preached the gospel and these people by the masses received Jesus, but he stayed long enough to teach them how to start prospering. He helped them dr uh, dig a well. From that well came water. Then he went and got seed for them and then gave them small loans called micro loans for businesses. And what he did was he took the small loan, he said $250 and they had a year to pay it back. And for them, that $250 was massive, but he took it and brought them seed. So I taught them how to plant it, how to work it, how to put the water on it, how to grow it, how to take enough for them to eat, but take the rest of it to town and sell it on a corner. Once they started building up, then they found ways of making blankets wet and laying over them. So the seed and all the way there, the plants would be fine by the time they got there. And then eventually they began to even bring them to stores and stores began to sell them. Their businesses began to grow. He said when he came back over two years later, he said to that same place, the biggest building in town was the church. The people were prospering. One guy had a pickup truck he had bought during that time from the finances that came in. And one man actually opened up and started a Toyota dealership. From the truck he bought, another truck he bought, and he finally ended up being and hired many, many people around there. It all started with showing them how to prosper. And this, what was happening was they put the kingdom of God first. They put the church first. They tied in the church and the church would seat some 1,200 people. So it was the most beautiful building in that, that little village. But the people did that. He said the place was unrecognizable when he got back. They had a year to pay that back and they did. They paid that back. And he took it put it into fund and did it for other people that came along. Again, uh, what this verse is simply saying is they do this, say continue, the Lord delights in the prosperity. Don't be jealous of those who's prospered before you and don't tell anybody about your situation. Dress fine, smile and act like you have plenty in your life. Act like all your needs are met because you know why? They are according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And understand this, you don't have to go around helping God by telling people you have a need so they'll give to you. God will see to it that it comes to you. Checks in the mail. Uh, income uh, increases, raises, promotions, all the different things that can come to you and the ways that God can do it. In, and ignore those who ridicule you for your prosperity. Realize your prosperity will be progressive and don't give up uh, because the return begins small. Give God the glory for everything that comes in. This is where prosperity comes from by starting with God. I'll see you tomorrow as we come back to the fifth, the last one in this series on a balance of prosperity. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact, or call us at 918-250-2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.